1947, near the arid stretches close to the Dead Sea, a groundbreaking discovery was made, one that would profoundly impact biblical scholarship and reinforce beliefs about the divine inspiration of Scripture. This was the unearthing of the Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient texts concealed for centuries within the caves of Qumran. Among these was the exceptionally well-preserved Isaiah Scroll, dating back approximately 200 years before Christ's birth, serving not only as an archaeological marvel, but also as a testament to divine revelation. The scrolls included a vast array of manuscripts, such as complete books of the Old Testament, fragmented texts, and other religious writings from the Jewish community. These were almost identical to the Hebrew Bible used today, affirming the scripture's accuracy and its preservation across millennia. Notably, every Old Testament book except Esther was represented. The Isaiah scroll in particular provided a tangible connection to prophecies about the forthcoming Messiah, composed centuries before Jesus' era. Parallel to this, in the 3rd century BC, the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, was produced, widely utilized within Hellenistic Jewish circles, and subsequently by early Christians. Its existence is pivotal as it demonstrates that the prophecies and texts predated Jesus and were not modified posthumously to align with his life story. The profound nature of this discovery lies in the consistency across the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Septuagint and the modern Bible, despite the differences in authorship, era, and language, underscoring a divine origin. These texts collectively reinforce the divine message illustrating the meticulous care with which these scriptures were transmitted, presumably guided by God's hand. Notable prophecies include Isaiah 9 verse 6, which describes the birth of a divine child destined to govern, a prophecy found in both the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Similarly, Isaiah 53 verse 3 foretells the suffering servant, a key messianic prophecy vividly portraying the Messiah's rejection and suffering a narrative realized in Jesus' life. Additionally, Isaiah 7 verse 14 predicts a virgin birth, a prophecy realized in the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus is born to the Virgin Mary, and he is named Emmanuel, signifying God with us. Further prophecies, such as Isaiah 35 verse 5 to 6, which foretell the Messiah's healing miracles, were substantiated by Jesus' acts as described in Matthew, affirming, his messiahship through physical and spiritual restoration. Moreover, Psalm 22, verse 16 to 18, details a crucifixion scenario remarkably described centuries before this execution method was known featuring the piercing of hands and feet and the division of garments by casting lots, all of which were fulfilled during Jesus' crucifixion. This event confirmed his role as the suffering servant, with Isaiah 53, verse 5 further emphasizing, the purpose of the Messiah's suffering to bear humanity's sins and offer salvation through his sacrifice, a theme echoed in 1 Peter 2 verse 24. In Zechariah 11 verse 12 to 13, the prophecy of being betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, which was later thrown to the potter in the house of the Lord, was precisely fulfilled by Judas Iscariot's actions as recorded in Matthew 26. This series of prophecies and their fulfillment not only affirm the scriptural integrity, but also reinforce the profound divine orchestration behind these historical and theological narratives. If I deliver him over to you, they said, and thus they counted out for him thirty pieces of silver. Zechariah's prophecy spoke of this exact sum, the price for which the Messiah would be betrayed. This prophecy was fulfilled when Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus for precisely 30 pieces of silver, which he later threw into the temple, fulfilling even the prophecy concerning the potter's field. Resurrection of Jesus' prophecy Psalm 16 verse 10 states, Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. This was fulfilled as detailed in Acts 2 verse 31. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. David's prophecy in Psalm 16 promised that God would not let his Holy One see decay. This prophecy was realized in the resurrection of Jesus, who rose from the dead on the third day, his body not seeing decay.
Peter cites this prophecy in Acts to affirm Jesus' resurrection, thus confirming his divine nature. The consistency of these prophecies across the Septuagint, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the modern Bible, all written centuries apart, provides compelling evidence of divine inspiration. These prophecies, fulfilled in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, underscore the miraculous nature of the Scriptures and affirm that they are indeed the Word of God, guiding us to the truth of Jesus as the promised Messiah. These are just a few of the many prophecies about the Messiah. For a comprehensive list of all the prophecies, check the description for a link to a website. In our quest to understand the divinity of Jesus and the accuracy of biblical prophecies, it's crucial to examine external sources that corroborate the New Testament accounts. These non-Christian sources provide valuable insights and lend credibility to the biblical narrative, confirming the historical existence and significance of Jesus Christ. Tacitus, in his annals written around A.D. 116, mentions Christus, Christ, referring to the execution of Jesus under Pontius Pilate during the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Tacitus writes, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class, hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate. This account not only confirms the crucifixion of Jesus, but also establishes the early existence of Christianity, recognized and persecuted by the Roman authorities. Flavius Josephus in his Antiquities of the Jews, written around A.D. 93-94, makes a significant reference to Jesus. In Book 18, Josephus writes, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man. For he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. For he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. This passage, though debated in authenticity, offers an invaluable reference to Jesus' existence and the early Christian movement, with claims of his resurrection aligning with New Testament. Pliny the Younger, in A.D. 112, wrote to Emperor Trajan about the Christians in his province. In his letter, Pliny describes the Christians' worship practices, stating they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a god. Pliny's observations confirm the early Christians' belief in Jesus as God and their practices of worship, highlighting their unwavering faith in the face of persecution. These historical accounts from Tacitus, Josephus, and Pliny the Younger are instrumental in validating the New Testament's portrayal of Jesus. They provide an external, non-Christian perspective that reinforces the accuracy and historical reliability of the biblical narrative, supporting the claim that Jesus of Nazareth was indeed a historical figure whose life, death, and resurrection were witnessed and recorded by both followers and skeptics alike. His martyrdom is detailed in Acts 7, verse 54 to 60, which concludes with Stephen's prayer, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. After saying this, he fell asleep. Thomas, known for his initial doubt about Jesus' resurrection, traveled far to spread the gospel, eventually reaching India according to tradition. Thomas was martyred by being pierced with spears by soldiers. His unwavering commitment to sharing the gospel, despite knowing the risks, underscores the strength of his faith. Ignatius of Antioch, an early Christian writer. And Bishop of Antioch was arrested and transported to Rome, where he was martyred around A.D. 107. During his journey to Rome, Ignatius wrote several letters to early Christian communities, expressing his eagerness to die for Christ. I am God's wheat, and I shall be ground by the teeth of beasts, that I may become the pure bread of Christ, he wrote in his letter to the Romans. These accounts of martyrdom highlight the apostles and early Christians' unwavering faith.
and willingness to face death rather than deny their belief in Jesus Christ. Their willingness to die for their faith serves as a powerful testament to the truth of the resurrection and the divinity of Jesus. People do not willingly face persecution and death for what they know to be a lie. The fact that these individuals chose martyrdom over renouncing their faith strongly supports the authenticity of their testimony and the reality of Jesus' resurrection. The Bible contains numerous passages where Jesus explicitly declares His divinity, affirming His identity as the Son of God. These declarations are foundational to Christian belief, illustrating Jesus' unique relationship with the Father and His role in the salvation of humanity. By examining these key passages, we gain a deeper understanding of Jesus' divine nature and His mission on earth. In Exodus 3 verse 4, God reveals His name to Moses. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This declaration of I am signifies God's eternal self-existent nature. Jesus echoes this divine name in John 8 verse 58 when He declares, Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. This statement caused an immediate reaction among His Jewish audience who recognized it as a direct claim to divinity, equating himself with the eternal God of Israel. In John 10 verse 30, Jesus makes a profound statement about his unity with God the Father. I and the Father are one. This declaration goes beyond mere agreement or alignment. It signifies a deep, intrinsic unity in essence and purpose. This statement led to an immediate attempt by his audience to stone him for blasphemy as they understood him to be claiming equality with God. In John 14, verse 6, Jesus declares, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This statement highlights Jesus as the exclusive path to God, embodying divine truth and life. By claiming to be the only way to the Father, Jesus asserts his unique and essential role in humanity's redemption and access to eternal life. In John 14, verse 9, Jesus further explains His divine identity to His disciples. Anyone who has seen Me has seen the Father. This statement underscores the perfect representation of God the Father in Jesus. Seeing Jesus is equivalent to seeing God, as He perfectly embodies and reveals the Father's nature and character. Read the passages, Colossians 1 verse 15 to 20, and Hebrews 1 verse 3 to get a better understanding of God's divinity. If this message has touched your heart and you feel called to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that you are the Son of God, the Messiah, and my Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and rose again, conquering death and offering eternal life. I repent of my sins and invite you into my heart. Transform my life with your love and grace. I commit to following you and growing in my faith. Thank you for your sacrifice and the gift of salvation. Amen. If you've prayed this prayer, we encourage you to reach out in the comments below. We love to support you in finding a community of believers to grow with. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more content that deepens your faith and understanding of God's Word. Let's continue this journey together, grounded in the truth and love of Jesus Christ.